Tarzan is back, and this time he's a Swedish vampire. No, that's not right. Uh, we'll figure it out ahead on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley. I'm joined today by William Harcourt Smith, a professor at the City University of New York and researcher with the American Museum of Natural History. Will, welcome. Thank you. It's Thank great you to be here. Thank you for being here. Um, I read that you are an expert in geometric morphometrics. I am. As, I am. Okay, as a non-scientist, that sounds like you have an incredible superpower. Is it? It is. Okay. Well, no, it isn't. It's, it sounds very, sounds very complicated and geeky, and it is. It's a technique for analyzing bones that we use, and it's, it's, a, it's a great and sophisticated way that, 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 that we have to, to actually sort of answer questions about the shapes of bones and how they differ, but it, it, it does sound a bit intimidating. Today, we're going to talk about Tarzan. In this new 2016 version, director David Yates lures Tarzan and Jane back to the Belgian Congo to battle Leon Rom, treacherous envoy of the equally vile King Leopold. There's a thousand men down there, 20,000 more on the way. We don't stand a chance. A normal man can do the impossible to save the woman he loves. My husband is no normal man. In this version of the story, the very first thing we see of Tarzan, Lord Greystoke, is his hand. And it's in a proper English glove, but it's held in a non-human way. Are ape hands so very much different than human hands? They're a bit different. I mean, overall, you look at the hands of an ape and the hands of a human, they're pretty similar. They've got five fingers, they can manipulate things and pick things up. But ape hands, the hands of chimpanzees and gorillas, do have specializations in them related to their knuckle walking, where they're walking around on all fours and putting some weight on, on their hands. Mm. And of course, human hands have special blood supply and, and, and nerve supply differences in them that relate to the fact that we can make tools and we can pick things up with great precision and, and, and we can shape things. Um, so there are some differences, yes. Are there, are there scientists who work with, with uh, apes who try to get them to, to use their hands in the same way we do? There are. There are scientists. There are scientists who try and sort of look at tool making behavior in apes and look at handedness and look at how they make tools and the pressure that go through their, their fingers when they're doing things. There's quite a lot of work going on that right now. It's, it's really interesting times we're in, actually. Handedness. Are, handedness. are, are there sure. apes who are left handed and um, right handed? We're still trying to figure that out. Um, that there's a lot of debate about handedness and, and when it happened in the, in the fossil record and stuff. There's people who find ancient stone tools and they, they try and say that they were left or right handed. Uh, I'm not sure if we're there yet on that. Later, the children marvel at the curl of his fingers, and Tarzan tells them that it's like that because he grew up running on up all running fours. He changed the bone structure. Is that, is that the scientific reason for the curling of ape fingers? Actually, it is not. Ah. It's not. So the curling in fingers is to do with climbing. Animals, uh, primates that climb a lot tend to have curved finger bones and the curvature relates to climbing not to running around on all fours it relates to being able to grab onto a branch and pull yourselves up the apes in tarzan stand straight up but then they drop back down to all fours so well how significant is it that humans stood up and stayed up it's hugely significant it's a great <laughs> question is is one of the most significant things that, that happened to us uh, in our evolutionary history it's what defines humans, along with our big brains, is walking on, on two legs in the way that we do. The way that we do it, one leg in front of the other, it's rarer than, than laying eggs in mammals today. We're the only creature that does it. And it, there's two creatures that lay eggs, the platypus and the echidna. And so it, it, it's, it's very specialized. And of course, in our wait, evolutionary wait, you're history... you're saying what's so unique is how we It's how walk? we do it. One leg in front of the other. Now look, there are other creatures like dinosaurs and things that also walk that way. But within mammals, the way that we do it is very, very specialized and unusual. And in our evolutionary history, it's the first thing that happens that 
separates us out from the, from the ape lineage. It's, it's walking upright is one of the behaviors and the features that relate to it are, uh, are used uh, to, to, to separate us out from our, our ape relatives. So what um, are the features that relate to walking upright? There are a ton, and I don't want to bore you with a huge long laundry I'm list. I'm here to be but, bored. But, no, 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 good, good, good. This is what I work on. Um, everything from our, our wide, uh, low, our sort of short, wide pelvis that acts like a cup to support our upright body, our long legs, uh, our, the locking mechanism in our knee, our, our large hip joint, our arched foot, uh, the way that our head balances on top of, of our spine. There's a suite of features throughout the whole skeleton that facilitate us uh, as we walk along on two legs. Because it's very easy to topple down uh, when you're walking on two legs. You know, if you're on three or four, it's a lot, it's, you're closer to the ground and you've got more support. But you you're could... right, and we forget this until, you know, I have, uh, you know, I have a two-year-old. Right, it, exactly. It, it, is, it is so sweet to yeah. see children learn, and you forget, like, it's hard. It is hard, and you know their bones aren't fully formed and aren't fully grow, grown. That's you know, and, and and you know, it takes it takes some coordination and and some time for it to happen. That's why you know the babies, the baby, I mean, you know, babies are very helpless. Human babies until one or two years old in terms of moving around, and even then they're sort of stumbling and, and stuff. But after that, we're incredibly good at it, and and we do it for the rest of our lives. I have to ask about eight feet. I right. mean, how helpful would it be for us to have a set of prehensile Toes. I mean, it seems like we should have still have those. It, it would be incredibly helpful. You just have to imagine you're sitting there and you can hold the remote in your feet and change and channels eat and, and, and like eat and do things. Exactly. Might, might alarm a few people, but anyway, it would be incredible. But of course, we are bipedal and we're walking on two legs, and our foot is heavily modified so that we can efficiently walk on two legs and, and get around. And so, you know, we, we've lost that ability to, to, to grasp and, 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 and pick up things with our feet and such. Some of the muscles that do that are still there, but, but, the, but, but in, in the foot, they, they, they- So they, we could kind of train ourselves well, if it were important? A little <laughs> bit, because the shape of the bones doesn't allow much movement. But people who lose their, their arms in accidents uh, can actually train to grasp with their feet a little bit. And there's, there's, there's people who paint with their feet and, and can do other things. I mean, it can yeah. be done, but you'll never get the mobility and the flexibility you would as in a chimpanzee or a gorilla or, or, or another ape. Are human feet an advantage or disadvantage? They're a huge advantage to us because the way that we walk around, we need this sort of stiff foot with this springy arch in it that, that makes our foot very efficient as we're walking along and, 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 and reduces the amount of energy that we have to put through to the ground. Um, we're putting a lot of force through our feet so they reflect that. No, it's a huge advantage and, it, and it's one of the things that really helps us be efficient bipeds. If we were climbing around in the trees, on the other hand, it would be a massive disadvantage. But we don't do that on the whole. Tarzan with the, is obviously our exception here. But, you know, we, we, we don't. And so we've lost one ability and gained another. And would a baby who grew up among apes demonstrate any of the things that we do see in Tarzan? <laughs> would, may, maybe curled fingers? We're, we're or... getting a little fanciful here, but I mean, it, it, it's possible they could have you know, some subtle differences. I mean, if a baby was brought up by gorillas and was, you know, climbing a lot in the trees. I mean, we have grasping hands. We can, we can, we can grasp things with our hands. Yes, you might see some modifications. We know, for instance, with apes, as they grow, that features like the curvature of their fingers do change a little bit because mm. when they're young, they're gripping on to, to, to mother and then they're climbing a lot. And as gorillas get bigger, they spend a little bit more time on the ground. And so we actually do get um, some subtle shifts in their in their in their curvature of their fingers and you know the sort of relative size of their bones you know just just the thickness of their bones rather you know, they, there are some subtle changes but it but it's 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 subtle. I'm just wondering it's it's a little distracting. I'm wondering if you can do geometric <laughs> morphometrics on this man's abs. I, um. I think you could, and I think I think he'd be an outlier certainly compared to me. Okay. <laughs> I think certainly compared to everybody. He's quite impressive. <laughs> We hear the phrase descended from apes all over pop culture. Right. Is, that, is that scientifically correct? Are we descended from apes? It actually is, but we're not descended from the living apes today. And that's really important to get across. Us and chimpanzees and gorillas all share a common ancestor. Ah. And now that ancestor was an ape, technically. And so we are descended from apes, but chimpanzees and gorillas, who are also apes, are descended from apes. Technically, we are actually apes. 
Um, we are still apes. Yes, absolutely. In a scientific sense, you know, we classify ourselves as a member of a group called hominoids, and hominoids are colloquially called apes. And that ah. today, that includes gibbons and, and chimpanzees and orangutans and gorillas and us. Um, now, we have a, a special name for our own subgroup within that called hominins, and that's because we walk bipedally and we have these huge brains and we have language and you know, we have all these other things that are, that are, that are very unusual. Uh, but we are descended from, from apes, just not the apes living today. So the apes from which we are all descended have, ha are gone? They're gone. They're extinct. Okay. Yeah. We only uh, have their fossils. Let's talk a little bit about the Planet of the Apes oh, franchise. Oh, great franchise. In the original French novel, La Planète des Singes, written by Pierre Boulle, who, by the way, also wrote The Bridge Over the River Kwai. I did not know that. Yeah. A journalist travels to a distant planet where industrious apes became the top species because humans grew complacent. In the 1973 movie, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, the reasons for ape evolution changed, and we discovered that a time-traveling chimpanzee named Caesar taught his fellow apes to speak and then led them in a rebellion following a human-induced nuclear war. Okay, so wow. so if we I know that's a lot. So if we discount the possibility of distant planets and nuclear war and time travel, so the entire plot, yeah, right? exactly. basically, um, what caused all these changes in the movies, or or, or uh, you know, I mean, you know, the argument is that that they taught the apes and they picked picked it up really quickly, and you know, it, it's sort of through active teaching and 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 if I remember correctly, mm. and then you know, based on based on that, you know, these these you know, presumably were, were either taught to their offspring or passed on in some way. It's a little fuzzy. Um, I, I would say there's a lot of major errors made there. You know, first of all, there's a sort of assumption of Lamarckian evolution, I think, in one part. And secondly, there's, there's an assumption of very active learning and, and active teaching. And we know, based on our studies, that chimps and gorillas don't actively teach. Uh, they can yeah. pick things up off adults and parents and such. So you can have a little infant chimpanzee, you know, sitting with its mother and its mother's taking a stone, it's using that stone to smash open a, you know, smash open a nut. And it's basically using that, that, that stone as a tool. And, the, and the, the, the infant might pick that up, but there's no active teaching. Um, so, you know, they've made a, a number of pretty outrageous assumptions in the movie. I mean, it's a great movie. I love it. It's really fun. Do you? But the, oh, totally. I mean, they're so cheesy. It's those, <laughs> those, those 70s, eight, I mean, the first is a classic and I think is, 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 is kind of wonderful. And, um, and I enjoyed the reboot. I mean, the most recent yeah. reboot. So they were, cl they were cleverly done, you know, um, even if wonderfully fanciful, you know. Are we still evolving? The short answer is yes, it, we are. Um, and, and the reason for that is evolution happens in lots of different ways. You know, you can just have mutations. I don't mean X-Men stuff. You know, you can have sort of little mutations in your DNA. Um, you can have random changes over time, something we call genetic drift. We have, you know, lots of people, you know, particularly in New York, it's a great melting pot, you know, different populations of people from different parts of the world, you know, crossing their genes with each other when they have children. Um, the most interesting question for me is natural, is, you know, is about natural selection and, and you know, it So will you it, please it define that for people? So natural selection, you know, is basically, you know, one of the mechanisms of evolution whereby, you know, traits that quote unquote give you an advantage uh, 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 increase in prevalence from generation to generation. So, if, you know, nat our, our bipedalism is a result of natural selection. The fact that we have four limbs, the fact that we have five fingers, the fact that we can see in stereoscopic vision are all special adaptations. They're features that, that in the past or now you know, give us you know, an advantage in some way. And it's, it's hard to tell how that is, 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 is happening right now because you need time to really see whether there is selection going on. Here's the interesting thought. If we go into space and we start to have colonies that are very isolated from each other, I suspect we might see a little bit more natural selection going on over long periods of time. Yeah. What if modern humans go many light years away and then live there for hundreds of thousands of years and then come back to Earth? Would they be different from us? That's what makes me think about that, and that's the, I, I, I don't I don't have an answer, but it's fun Will, to think about. you need to you know? write a science fiction movie. That is fun to think about. Maybe scary, maybe, <laughs> maybe scary. Fun, could be, be could be a great sort of sci-fi horror, right? You know, yeah. they come back and they think they think they're all going to be the same, and they're not. You know, yeah. Or, I mean, there's a lot of ethical and moral 
you know, things to think about there. Would they be the same species? How would they treat each other? How would they interact? It's sort of scary to think about. In 2011, Planet of the Apes got a reboot. Roddy McDowell's rubber-masked Caesar has been replaced by Andy Serkis's CGI'd Caesar. And the cause of the apes uprising is now a multi-film combination of enhanced cognition via drugs plus some kind of simian flu. Yeah. The apes are smarter than us. They're stronger than us. They've become us. Uh, ah, if any of that could happen, if apes could, you know, actually achieve the intellectual capacity we normally assign to humans, would apes continue to be apes or would they become human themselves? That is a great question. And, you know, in part, we are who we are because of our evolutionary heritage and the features that we use to define our group, you know, include walking upright and our big brain and language and such. If you would get an ape group evolving those features independently. You, you might have to take the whole group and reevaluate how you, how, you, how you organize their relationships. But we do see features independently arising in different groups. For instance, birds fly and bats fly, but we don't put them in the same category because mm. they have separate evolutionary histories and they've achieved their flight through different means. The fact that a chimpanzee has developed bipedalism still makes it a, chi a bipedal chimpanzee, but it's still a chimp. But given that we use these features, you know, to define hominins, I think, I think we'd have our work cut out for us and we'd have to sit down and have a rethink about where we organize everything and, and where we name everything. But things do happen independently in evolution, you know, and, 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 and so based on the, their lineage and who they were, you'd still put them in a discrete group but it would perhaps change, change, change us in, 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 the, in the way that we think about our uniqueness as, right. as humans. What it really makes, would. So what is it that makes us human? Many things. I mean, I would argue that what makes us human is our, the way that we walk on two legs and all the features that we have that relate to that, our incredibly big brain, and the various attributes that come with our big brain, such as language, such as culture, Okay. such as consciousness, artistic expression. I think, I think all of those are unique human features. Other attributes like tool making, I feel like we're more on a continuum. Chimps make tools, orangutans make tools, um, but they don't really have language. They don't walk on two legs in the way that we do. And they don't have artistic expression, whether they have consciousness or, or not in, 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 the, in the human sense of it is open to debate. It's interesting because if someone asked me what makes us human, I would start with that list of things that are so sort of right. es esoteric, you right. know, like self-awareness and right. consciousness and maybe spirituality. Mm -hmm. But you remind me that they come from a biological, physical thing. It right. comes from our bigger brain. It does. It comes from our huge and complicated brain. Um, and, and that really, all those, all those things come from that. Um, now, self-awareness is an interesting one. There, there is a, a a lot, the many researchers feel that certain apes are self-aware. You know, you put a, a red dot on the forehead of a chimp and give it a mirror, it, 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 it touches it and it knows mm. that uh, that red dot is on it. You do that. And it realizes yeah, it's now and you, part of a Hindu religion. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, exactly. But you do that with a cat, it just sees another cat in the mirror. You know, it doesn't oh, know it's it. Really? Yeah. And so, you know, there, there's something there, you know, there really is. There's a whole bunch of smug, condescending but, cats who are like, right. we know Wait it's there, we're we just not going to bother to touch exactly. it to make you happy. We just don't care, right? Exactly. Right. Uh, jumping back to Tarzan, in this 2016 version, real historic facts collide with film fantasies. George Washington Williams, played by Samuel L. Jackson, was a real African-American soldier who, upon returning from the Congo, wrote passionately about the abuses he saw there. And Leon Rahm, played by Christophe Waltz, really was the Belgian station commander at Boyoma Falls. Rom was famous in his own lifetime for the brutality of his administration and may have served as the inspiration for characters in Joseph Conrad's terrifying novella, Heart of Darkness. But Rom died in Brussels in 1924 and not in Congo, as we see him in the film, torn to shreds by crocodiles. Herds of wildebeests never trampled the Boyoma port, saving the good humans from the bad humans, and Belgium held Congo until 1960.
So, Will, you know, movies are such a central part of our storytelling they these are. days. They are, of course. Yeah, as a scientist, does this, does this warping of truth bother you? It, it does, but of course, you know, look, Tarzan is based on the novels and the whole series, and it's, you know, they, those are, are fanciful stories, and they have fanciful endings as a result. You know, and, you know, so in this film, you know, from a historian's perspective, I think, you know, a historian would probably have more, more reason to be outraged, but, you know, because in realities, you know, it was a br wickedly brutal uh, uh, regime, the, yeah. the, the Belgian regime, uh, particularly under King Le Leopold, the first part of it, but, but all the way through, to be honest, and, and um, you know, it didn't end well. Uh, and, and, and there are still ramifications today. So, um, of course, in that, the sort of Hollywood component of it, you know, where the baddies get killed at the end. I mean, you've got to have it. It's a Hollywood movie. It's in the Tarzan books and such. And so I understand, you know, they, they've been faithful to the story, not history, you know. Um, from a scientific viewpoint, you know, which is, you know, more what, you know, obviously where I come in, um, you know, I, one is irritated when they muck around with science. Yeah. Uh, it, it is, it, it, it wasn't too terrible in this movie, you know. Um, so there were some bits that actually were in aspects of the ape behavior that were reasonably well researched. But Which of course- you said like the, um, the demonstrations of aggression. Some of the, demon some of the demonstrations of aggression Can you give me an example where there, you watched it and you were like, oh, they nailed it. There was a great bit there where Tarzan, and I think also the Samuel L. Jackson character, they were basically having to be deferential to this alpha male that Tarzan had previously known. And Tarzan was telling the Samuel L. Jackson character, you know, for goodness sake, be deferential. You know, being, you know you've got to show that this alpha individual that he's in charge. And, you know, that happens with, with, with chimps and gorillas, you know, with these dominant displays. It happens, displays. It happens, with, it happens with human men It happens as with well. human men, it certainly <laughs> does. But the aspects like, like that, where they were dealing with the social interactions and the dominance yeah. hierarchies, I thought, you know, that, there, that, that, that was interesting and, and sort of, you know, nicely done, even if it was very ho Hollywoodized, you know. Um, but there are, you know, there, there's always other things, you know, there's, you know, where they sort of beef them up and they over-dramatize the way that they move. And I get it, it's Hollywood. You know, they've got to make a call and they've got to make it exciting. You know, the reality might be a little less glamorous and, and, and a little less sort of movie worthy. Um, so you uh, understand, uh, you understand why Hollywood over dramatizes yeah. and messes up. But is there is there a danger sometimes when Hollywood messes up the science? Absolutely, there can be a danger. And and and, and you know, for instance, you know, you know, if if a movie were to deliberately try and, 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 and deny evolution or deny climate change or something like that, it can be very very dangerous. You know, you want you want people to you know leave movies that are trying to be scientifically accurate, not, not misinformed. You don't want people to think that we evolved from the gorillas or chimps, for instance, because we didn't. Chimps and gorillas have their own evolutionary trajectory. Um, on the other hand, you know, you, you, you know, you're trying to make a cool movie, you know, and, you're, and you know, science fi when it gets into science fiction and, and the movies like Planet of the Apes, it's so gloriously fanciful, it almost doesn't matter, you know? It's interesting, I think, that most people who believe in evolution, or when you say it sounds better, evolution, um, <laughs> um, do, I think the general understanding is we, did, we evolved from, from apes, right? No You're argument. saying that's, that's wrong. Um, that we, you're saying well, we all we evolved, evolved from the same We, we did evolve from ape apes. Ancestor. We just didn't evolve from the apes that lived today. Got it, right. Yeah. Um, however, I've always wanted to ask someone like you, who um, devotes his career and his mind to studying <laughs> evolution, what do you do when you come across a person, and maybe you don't often have conversations like this, with, uh, who just doesn't believe in evolution? Can you tell me some a, a kind of exchange you've ever had? I've had, I have had numerous exchanges, and you know it varies. You know, first of all, if somebody says they don't believe in evolution, I don't tell them. I said it's not about belief. It is, a, it is about knowing that there are these scientific facts out there that explain what happened. And so we start with that usually, and I listen. I think the first thing to do is listen to people and, and understand where they're coming from, because usually it comes out of either ignorance and or fear, you know. And one of, the, one of the things I tell them, and I always start with this, I say, believing in a God has got nothing to do with explaining scientific processes. The fact that there is gravity, the fact that we have the theory of relativity, the theory of evolution, and we use the word theory as an explanation in science, you know, these things happened and happen. It doesn't mean there isn't a God. That is a totally mm. separate so if you take that off yeah. the table, and you can have a different. Yeah, I'm going to say we. Yeah, then we're just haggling about facts <laughs> and, and bargaining, you know. And because I'm saying, I'm not telling you there is always, and it's arrogant if a scientist to tell someone there is always a God, because it's the supernatural. It's not the natural, and we're interested in the natural world. And so, you know, 
you, 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 put, you take that off the table and then you talk about the facts. And sometimes people say, well, it's in the Bible. And then you're like, okay, so do you believe everything in the Bible? Right. And they go, well, I do. I said, great. In the Bible, it says you can't eat pork, you know? Tell me about Put down the, that bacon, tell me about the bacon tell me you what you think about. In the Bible, it says it's okay to sell your daughters into right. slavery. You really okay with that? You know, they like, then they'll go, well, no. I'm like, so why? So which, which bits are you cherry picking then? You know, and so you can have that conversation if you want. And I, you don't want to denigrate people, mm -hmm. you know, um, but you do want to listen and you want to separate the religion from the science and, and explain that these are, these, are, these are not worlds that should be telling each other what to do, you know, and then you sort of take it from there. I well, don't meet many in New York, I have to, yeah, has to be said. I, I you know. suspect you're not often yeah. hanging out no. with, yeah, with creation. I wouldn't choose to either, really. But, you know, you meet people and sometimes people's parents and they're a little bit unsure about it all, yeah. you know. Um, but, but I try and listen respectfully first before going for the jugular. Well, thank you. That is, that is about all we have time for. I'll take my... I'll take my, you take your prehensile my, hands. My prehensile Very hands nice to and meet. shake it was great yours. Fun. That's you. right. Not at all. You can find out more on this and other subjects on our Science Goes to the Movies Facebook page. And if you want to watch past episodes, check us out at www.cuny.tv under the Science tab.